Happy Friday. John Lorden here with a new episode of Brain Scratch. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get to things, I just want to let you guys know we are off next week. All the shows taking a break for next week. We're going to CrimeCon this weekend. It's been a lot of work ramping up for that. And CrimeCon, quite honestly, always wears me out. So all of next week we are off, but we will return on Monday, June 7th with our normal show schedule. So on to today's case. A person is murdered by an assailant wearing all black, although you can see just around their eyes a little bit, and it's all caught on videotape. Sound familiar? We're not talking about the Missy Beavers investigation, though there are some striking similarities, one of those being we're not sure if it's a man or a woman dressed all in black. Let's dive into the story together and see what we can learn, starting with where does today's case take place. With a quick stop at Wikipedia, Oconee County is a county located in the northeastern part of the U.S. state of Georgia. As of the 2010 census, the population was over 32,000 people. The county seat is Watkinsville. Watkinsville is where there is a racetrack gas station. And uh, it's kind of interesting. We had racetrack come up in a case several weeks ago, the Allen White case. It was the last place he was seen. Bit of a different occurrence that we have here, though. Um, One evening, a young man is working at the gas station when tragedy strikes. Uh, For anyone not familiar, Racetrack is an American corporation that operates a chain of gas service stations across the southern United States. The firm is Georgia's third largest private company with sales of $9.1 billion in 2013. And this one in particular, and I I think most of them, run uh, 24-7. They're open all night long. They have all kinds of different services, food and beverages, that you can get. Uh, If you're from California, it's probably a bit like an AM, PM, or maybe even a 7-Eleven gas station if you happen to be around one of those. Uh, Here in the Midwest, you know, like uh, probably more like a Super America or or something like that. But let's learn about some of the basics of this case over at onlineathens.com. Oconee County Sheriff's deputies are trying to identify a killer who brazenly walked into a gas station on the outskirts of Watkinsville early Friday and shot the clerk to death during an apparent robbery. Elijah Wood, a 23-year-old resident of Watkinsville, was killed behind the checkout counter. Wood's body was found about 1.40 a.m. by a customer. A patron came into the store to buy some drinks on his way to work, and when he got up to the counter, he saw the clerk behind the counter on the floor. He called us, the sheriff said. A responding deputy attempted to render aid to Wood, but he died in the store. The suspect was covered from head to toe in black clothing, so we don't know race or gender yet other than our speculation, said Sheriff Hale. Uh, And here you can see, obviously, there's some decent cameras in this establishment. We've got some pretty good uh, screen grabs from those cameras, and we also have footage that we'll be looking at as well. Investigators don't know how the killer arrived at the store. I think we can pretty much assume from that that they didn't park in the parking lot for the store. I'm sure the racetrack has cameras outside as well. They've got pumps out there, so they're watching those. Uh, Seems like they parked somewhere else. But uh, investigators are studying outside video cameras and other cameras in the area that might provide a clue, according to Sheriff Hale. And here is Elijah Wood. I can tell you guys from taking a look through his Facebook, this is someone very dedicated to family. Uh, Seems like someone that has strong faith as well. And a young guy, he's only 23 years old when this occurs. Uh, It's just, it's really, really heartbreaking. I know usually we save the GoFundMes till the end of the episode, but this one is kind of amazing. Uh, $44,000 raised. They've actually shut it down at this point. We can't donate to it. Uh, But I wanted to stop here so we could learn a little bit more about Elijah. My brother-in-law, Mary Wood's twin brother, Elijah James Wood, was murdered on March 19th, 2021, between 1 and 2 a.m. while working at racetrack in Watkinsville, Georgia. Elijah was a great man, huge in stature and in heart. Elijah was 23 and about to celebrate his 24th birthday on the 26th of this month. He dies literally a week before his birthday. 
He was a big family man and believed in family and always making special efforts to be a part of the family. He loved his God and his country and was always willing to help anyone he felt was in need. He would go out of his way to check on you. He will be truly missed and always loved. This world has lost a treasure. I wish all could have met Elijah. Oh, it just always grabs at my heart, these losses of such young lives like this. Um, over at 11alive.com, in one day, the online fundraiser totaled over $30,000. Donations from over 500 people, some leaving memories and condolences for the family. Quote, I enjoyed our conversations. They made a long ride home a bit easier, one community member said about his interactions with Elijah at Racetrack. Many comments included how helpful and willing Elijah was to others. As a matter of fact, the person that sent this in through the tip page over at lordandarts.com uh, seems to have been a customer of the store as well and had nothing but nice things to say about this person that would help brighten their day a little bit. And, um, you know, if you've got a regular stop at a, a location like this or a business like this, um, please let those people know how much you appreciate them as as uh, as much as you can for just being a part of your life. From what I can see, this guy's interactions with people was was just amazing. He was always there trying to uplift people, which just makes this all the more tragic. Over at Oconeyenterprise.com, Wood remembered as a sweet soul, towering in stature, but even mightier in heart. Elijah James Wood was a 23-year-old gentle giant who never met a stranger and believed that personal happiness can only be achieved by making other people happy. In the early morning hours of Friday, March 19th, Wood was shot and killed while working his shift. It was one week before his 24th birthday, which he shared with his twin sister, from what I understand. Uh, Wood greeted every customer with a smile. On his Facebook page, Wood quoted English poet Joseph Addison, who said, What sun is to flowers? smiles are to humanity. Just in the few minutes of speaking to him, I could tell he was a sweet, personable guy, said Ashley Eaton, who had stopped at the store last Tuesday. I don't think he stopped smiling the entire time. Wood would sometimes help his friend Gregory Schultz with Athen Banner Herald deliveries. Frequent customer David Westbrook even promised to take Wood fishing. Described as a hardworking, patriotic young man who loved his family, Many remember him as a disciple of Christ who attended revivals and lived by the golden rule. Of course, that being treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. And it just seems really unfortunate that um, this type of occurrence had to happen with uh, someone coming in and taking his life. And in a way where we, I don't know, we'll watch the footage, but I can't make a lot of sense out of it by seeing what's going on there. Honestly, my first impression on the footage is it seems like the person is there for with with the specific intent of killing him and then leaving that that's it but we're going to talk about some conditions that might change our perception of that as we go on here today uh, over at 11alive.com, this is a tough day for us. We know Elijah and his family well, in a good way, the sheriff's office said in an online statement. We didn't have to look up his father's address because we already knew where he lives. The sheriff's office is now urging anyone with information on the killer to step forward. They've released photos in hopes that someone will recognize the suspect. However, the person's face is heavily obscured by a dark mask and drawn hoodie. So we've seen the kind of far away shots. Here are the best close ups that they've been releasing of the suspect. And I got to tell you, from the conversations I'm seeing happen online, a lot of people think this suspect is wearing makeup. And a lot of people, I think, because of that, are leaning with the assumption that this could be a female. As a matter of fact, I could say the majority of people, at least in the threads that I'm seeing around this, are saying they think it's a female. Other people are saying, no, I think it's a male. Uh, I think in either case, they they could be wearing makeup. It just really looks to me like there's eyeliner in particular, like the lines that are being drawn around their eyes are really, really hard. And I don't know if this is done. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with like contrast changes and brightness changes on video and in pictures. This looks like more than that to me. I'm a little concerned that maybe if they ran this through some kind of AI touch up, that the AI is actually drawing that in. 
but I don't think that's what's going on here because so much of the image outside of that uh, is pretty harshly blurred. And I think the AI would have cleaned that up as well. So it does kind of seem like these are pretty dark, very strong lines. And it looks like they are all around, all the way around both eyes. But let's take a look at the footage because um, you guys know I'm always looking for intent in these cases. Can we tell from the footage what the intent of this person is? Maybe with, with how they're coming in, um, how they're moving when they're in there. So it certainly seems like a person that's driven just with the tempo of how they're walking in. There's also a moment where their hand kind of kicks out right there at the end, though, like their thumb swings out. It looks to me like they're saying something like they're they're talking to him as they approach. But you can see we're talking a matter of a few seconds and then this person heads out, but wait, turns around, comes back with I don't know that that hopping motion, it almost seems like a confidence thing. I don't know if they're coming back to check to make sure. But they spend practically no time over there and then run back out the door really disturbing and certainly kind of strange. Uh, investigators said the gunman walked into the store covered from head to toe in black clothing, pointed his handgun at Wood and pulled the trigger. Um, now, we're not being told how many shots. I don't know if it's a single shot or not. I don't think we're going to bump into those details as we're going through uh, everything here again today. So, And it's interesting because in the video that we are seeing, um, there's nothing that I could recognize as flashes from the muzzle or anything like that going on. So I really have no idea uh, in terms of how many shots might have been fired. Quote, we haven't been able to review all the camera footage. We don't know for sure whether anything was taken from the store. So we're trying to get all that information together. We don't want to speculate on what the motive was and what the means for why it happened, Sheriff Hale said. So obviously... Uh, you know, he, he's trying to stay pretty level about processing this to try to figure out that intent. About the family, he says, they were devastated. We went to their house and woke them up in the dead of the night to let them know that their loved one had been gunned down in a convenience store they were working at, the sheriff explained. Only Wood and the gunman were in the store at the time of the shooting, the deputies said. Now, I did see some information about another potential witness that they were reaching out to. From what I understand, this isn't someone that was in the store at the same time, but this is someone that was at the store kind of around the same time or leading up to this occurrence. Uh, Oconee County Sheriff's Office also posted a photograph of a potential witness on social media. Please emphasize the witness who appears to be a middle-aged white man walking through the front of the convenience store was not a suspect in the case. I went looking through all their posts. I can't find that image anymore. Um, my suspicion is they found him and they spoke to him and they removed that image from Facebook. Sheriff's officials did say, however, that it was imperative that we speak with that individual according to a Facebook post, which included a surveillance photo of a white four-door pickup truck parked at the scene. Uh, same thing, that, that photo seems to have been deleted. Back to onlineathens.com. Oconee County Deputy Jeremy Wasden said, and this is still the first weekend that this happened effectively, we are working every angle and following every lead. Throughout the weekend, investigators put in very long hours. You chase down every lead and hope that you get to something that pans out. It's a tough case. That's all that there is to it. Uh, certainly, and if we do draw some comparisons to the Missy Bieber's case, we're still waiting years later for justice in that case for some answers. And it's kind of similar. This is about, this actually might be just a little bit more detailed than the close up that we got from the Missy Bieber's case. But it's it's just striking to me. It's, it's almost exactly the same amount of face that you're seeing in this image as well. Uh, deputies did locate an older white male. So I think they're talking about that guy they were looking for in the last article and another man who were at the store around the time of the crime. But other than describing what they saw, they couldn't provide any leads on the suspect, according to Wasden. As for whether the killer is male or female, Wasden said, we're not going to rule anything out. 
We certainly have our opinion, but I won't get into that. And uh, we'll see. We'll see if we get some more opinions as we go through here. Still that first weekend, friends, family, police looking for answers. Here we have friends standing on the lawn near the racetrack gas station on Sunday afternoon, March 21st, holding signs, hashtag justice for Elijah. Tip's phone number has been included. Speaking of which, if you have information on this case, the description box down below has the contact information that you need. And there is a substantial reward that is attached to this case at this point. We'll get to that as we continue through the articles here. Uh, let's take a look over at the Facebook page for the Oconee County, Georgia Sheriff's Office and uh, see what uh, their considerations are very early in the case. This case has shocked our entire community. And trust me when I say that we're doing everything humanly possible to solve it. We've been touched by your outpouring of love and kindness to Elijah's family. I also want to assure you that Racetrack has been extremely supportive of the family and helpful in the investigation in a level that is beyond our expectations. We are tirelessly working around the clock with our local, state, and federal partners to follow every lead to its logical conclusion. We are following evidence and facts, not chasing theory and conjecture. And that is one of the tough things we frequently see in cases like this that, you know, law enforcement will put out some information like video or like images like that. And then soon they have to come out with a statement about, okay, please stop sending us all these tips because we can't process all this stuff. And we're worried that you're taking our attention away from the real aspects of the case that we need to focus on. I can tell you with the threads that I've seen around those images being released by the sheriff's office here, People are just, they're attaching Facebook profiles of people that they think might be the person. And I gotta say, in a lot of cases, they're they're attaching profiles of, of women there. Um, I don't think that's what the sheriff's office is looking for here. I don't think that's the type of interaction they're looking for. If you're someone that has information and you know, hey, someone was acting really weird that night, you know, a friend of mine or an acquaintance of mine uh, just wasn't the same the, the following day or missed work or something along those lines. Those are the types of things that should be called into the tip line also. I don't think those should be posted kind of publicly on Facebook. You want to make sure that that information gets into where it can be helpful and, and really be used by investigators as quickly as possible. And I don't know that the investigators working the case, I would, I would probably think those aren't the people that are monitoring the Facebook page. So, um, but interestingly, in this case, we don't see them kind of put out that, you know, that message to the public, hey, we're being overrun by your suggestions here of random Facebook pages that you're pasting in, in the comments down below. Please understand that we have to protect the integrity of the investigation and there is evidence and information that has not and will not be released. If I may speak plainly to you, a little bit of a warning here, baseless theories are not helpful. And quite frankly, there has not been enough information released for anyone to form a logical conclusion. Like all of you, I am appalled by this heinous act, and as a member of our community, I want this crime solved as much as anyone. As your sheriff, I promise that your sheriff's office is working as hard as we can to solve this crime. Signed by Sheriff James A. Hale, Jr. Um, and he puts it plainly here back at onlineathens.com. It's a tough one. We're working hard at it, he said. I need that one break that will bust this case wide open, but right now, we don't have it. And obviously, that's why we're here talking about this case. That's why I want you guys to share this. If you have friends or family in Georgia, let's make sure that they know Elijah's story. Maybe they have the piece or maybe a friend of theirs has the piece that helps solve this. We can see uh, they are working extremely hard. I can tell you, I look into cases frequently. Their Facebook page, there is a constant pulse about this case and more than just, hey, it's been another month and here we are. Hey, it's been another month and here we are. Um, there is a constant pulse going on with this case. I think they know that you know the public wants to see some answers in this and they want to let the public know we are working on this. We are working on this. We're still looking for justice. Someone out there has information that can help them. And uh, we're going to talk about some more possibilities with that as we're continuing here today. Officers have been gathering video footage from other locations in an effort to identify a vehicle the gunman might have used. 
So we've got another piece of video we'll be looking at as well. Uh, we don't know anything about the vehicle, Hale said, adding that the killer did not arrive in a vehicle that had parked in the store's lot. So pretty much confirmation there. They parked somewhere else. Uh, we also have the FBI analyzing the video to look for details we might have missed or couldn't see, he said. I, I love that. I just, a case of this nature, we saw it in the Missy Beavers case. They are tough. They are really tough to process. All hands on deck. Get all the help that you can to start looking at this. Um, the video shows the killer leaving the counter after shooting Wood, pausing at the door, then returning to the counter momentarily before leaving the store. We don't know what the purpose for that was, Sheriff Hale said. If there was audio, that might shed some light on it, but there's not any, so we can't hear anything that happened in the store. It's really unfortunate that they aren't recording audio in some of those safety systems. It's weird because uh, most of the time we hear that there's no audio. Uh, now with some of these newer cameras that are like, you know, doorbell cameras and outdoor cameras and stuff like that, audio seems to be becoming a little bit more of a normal thing. I wish businesses would kind of jump on that and uh, just get some audio hooked up into those same video systems. I'm sure it would be some type of minor upgrade to, to be able to do that. Obviously, the person has a distinctive walk and a distinctive way of moving around, Hale said. The video also shows the person is likely right-handed. Uh, a funeral was held for Wood, who leaves behind his father, a sister, and two brothers. From what I understand, he was also an amazing uncle. And here, there is a vigil that is held um, kind of at the same location where we saw them holding the signs asking for justice. It's near the racetrack gas station on March 26th. Approximately 60 mourners participated in tonight's candlelight vigil to remember Elijah Wood. Sheriff James Hale and several deputies were among those who paid their respects. I think that's really, really cool for them to, to be there to show their support as well. We're working hard, Hale said. We're receiving assistance from the GBI, FBI, and even ATF to work this case. And that vigil happened on Elijah's 24th birthday. Over to ConeyEnterprise.com, dozens of people who attended the vigil shared stories about Wood, but also stressed the importance of helping spread the word about a $10,000 reward for information that could lead to an arrest. We have to get the word out there, said vigil organizer Janelle Gamble. The national media doesn't want to hear about it. We need to let them know that we're not going to be silent. It is our job to not let Elijah be forgotten. And I need your guys' help once again. Please help us raise exposure to this case. And now we get to the second piece of footage that we have to review in today's case. Once again, posted from the Oconee Sheriff's Office. This video shows a vehicle of interest arriving prior to the racetrack shooting. The vehicle is seen traveling 441 South, turning right onto Hog Mountain Road, driving past the racetrack, turning right onto West or Wellbrook Road, and stopping for a period of time before driving away. And then it notes this video speed may not be in real time. Um, so just to give you the map, here's where the racetrack is. They're saying it's coming south on 441, making a right on Hog Mountain, and then a right on Wellbrook, and then parking somewhere up here, and then at some point taking off and leaving. Uh, anyone with information on this vehicle or may, who may have seen this vehicle uh, is asked to contact the Oconee County Sheriff's Office. Uh, so let's check the video. Now I gotta tell you guys, the view on this video isn't great. Um, I've got a new version that we'll take a look at, but it's this car way back here. We can see it gets to an intersection, makes a right at that intersection, then it's over here, literally dips out of screen, kind of comes back in. This uh, lens seems to have a bit of an angle on it. And then way out here somewhere, you're gonna see it make a right turn. That's where it makes that final right turn. And then it stops and parks somewhere about here. Now I wanna note, there, see these lights here? There's another vehicle that's coming I don't think this is the same vehicle. And the only reason I'm concerned about it is because they're still letting the video play to this point and showing all of this of it down here. Now, it could be that there's an edit in there. I think that's why they're they're trying to note that, hey, look, 
uh, this video might not be in real time. The beginning of the video has a time code and I can tell that is actually in real time for the first view. The views after that, the time code disappears, so I can't confirm if it's in real time or not. But I made a version of this where I've zoomed in as much as I can uh, and still trying to be reasonable with being able to tell what's what and not turning everything into giant blocks on us. Uh, so let's take a look at this one. So this is zoomed in just on kind of that sweet spot of right before the intersection. There. My impression on it, and this is this is not professional at all. You know, this is me just using my little video editing tools for my YouTube channel here. And there's all kinds of color that's being thrown around here. We got big bright lights. This one shifts from blue to red, just as about as it passes. Um, there's certainly a red tint that is being kicked off of it as it's going through this intersection. But I don't know. There's big bright light sources around here. It could be a white truck and it could be that a red source is hitting it and making it look that way. Um, it just, it kind of seems like it, I don't know, kind of seems like there's a red hue on that that's pretty strong. Here's the same scene, kind of zoomed in, following it the whole way. And there it is. And then one more time, just slowed down 25%. That's about the best that, that I can get with that. Now here's the other one where it comes into frame and just leaves the frame really quickly. Here it is 25% slower. And now here's where it goes and does the parking job. So we can see it pretty clearly here. And especially because you can see it's two separate headlights, you can tell about that right turn because of the shape, the change of the shape of the red lights. But I can also see a little bit of the front lights still kind of kicking out here. And at first, when this guy went driving by, I'm like, oh, I wonder if his lights were lighting up something on the road there. But you can see this white light is still happening. There is what I think is an edit there, but it seems to me like that's already after um, that other vehicle has driven by. So that vehicle at the end, I'm like 90% sure that's not the same vehicle. This is the vehicle that they've described in terms of its movements. It can, I can still see its brake light a little bit. Now I can st still see its headlight. That's the location for its headlight. And it's still there. It's like a pixel, but it's still there as that other car drives by. This video release coincides with a significant jump in the reward offered in the case from 10,000 to $25,000. The first reward didn't render much as far as evidence is concerned, so we decided to bump it up, said Sheriff James Hale. It's possible that vehicle is associated with the suspect, but we don't know for sure. We're putting it out there to see if we can get anybody, a car salesman or someone who can tell us what they see in the video, which is not very good. I mean, he's admitting it, it's, it's not great. I mean, it's on the fringes of that camera. It's way out in terms of distance. But there is a possibility someone might know the vehicles make through the headlights or taillights, he said. Uh, yeah, especially on that zoomed one, I think you get a decent sense of the proportion of the taillights. But, you know, you don't really get the shape because you're zoomed in so far at that point. It just turns them into a square. So it, it is going to be tough. It's definitely a vehicle that is of interest to us because it comes through the area right before the killer shows up in the video at the store, the sheriff said. I'm pretty sure with them being able to check the time codes on all of these different security systems, I'm pretty sure that they know that that's, that's the car they're looking for. Investigators have not determined a motive for the crime and said nothing was stolen from the station. It's just really weird. Robbery gone wrong? Like, is, is that a, a possibility here? He come... He, I want to say he, we don't know that it's a he. Someone comes in, says, hey, you're going to give me all your money. What, does does Elijah say, no, I'm not? And then they say, oh, okay, boom, and then run out? I just, you know, if if there was some struggle that had happened, like that, that seems like a robbery gone wrong situation for me. There would have to be enough time that the robber got to the counter Maybe there was some kind of struggle that happens there. The gun goes off. The robber gets freaked and says, I'm out of here and just bolts out. 
But once again, you've got them heading for the door. Oh no, I'm not, I'm turning back, coming back for literally a second and then turning around and, and going back out. It's really, really odd. And what would, if their intent was a robbery, how did that get just completely thrown to the side so quickly? Um, I mean, think of the planning that's gone into this. They're not even parking in the parking lot. They're very aware they're gonna be on camera. Um, as a matter of fact, maybe there's someone that's driving that car as well. This, this could have been planned with more than one person even. So if you're putting all this forethought, I mean, you're, you're dressing up to pull this thing off. You're parking in a specific place to pull this thing off. Then you get in and you just completely blow it. I, I just, I struggle with it. At least with how the video looks, uh, you know, for what we're seeing of the video. And we've got a really important condition. We will get to it, I promise. Uh, another post here from April 19th, where the sheriff's office is basically giving an update. Today makes one month since Elijah Wood was senselessly murdered. Our thoughts and prayers are with his friends, family, and with his community as they grieve and try to come to grips with this loss. We do want everyone to know this case is still active and solving it is our number one priority. The following is some of the work which has been done and continues to be done. From the beginning, we've worked with GBI, FBI, ATF, and numerous other local agencies to ensure every possible investigative technique is applied to this case. I'm really glad to hear that. Dozens of potential suspects have been called in through our tip lines. Uh, through many hours of interviews, we've been able to eliminate 10 of those suspects. Tips continue to come in and we continue to sort through the information. Several search warrants have been issued and the information gathered is being analyzed. Um, kind of curious, I guess some of those might be for cameras if the businesses aren't being particularly helpful. I would, I would think most businesses are going to help in a case like this, but maybe not. Uh, video surveillance has been collected from local businesses in the area. Countless hours of video surveillance has been viewed. Uh, relevant video evidence has been sent away for analysis by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. $25,000 reward has been raised. Deputies and family members have passed out thousands of reward posters. So certainly a lot of help that's been going on with this. Uh, I bumped into a podcast I have not heard of before called Classic City Crime Podcast. It's hosted by a guy named Cameron J. Uh, I've only listened to, he's put out two episodes about this case so far. I've listened to both of them. They're not super long. I think one of them 16 minutes. They're, they're about 15 minutes each. Um, and I just got to say, based off what I'm hearing so far, Cameron's doing a good job. I want to share just a little clip from this show where he is interviewing uh, James Hale, Sheriff Hale, and uh, what Sheriff Hale thinks about the case at this point. And this is as of April 30th. We don't believe that it was a personal killing. We okay. we believe that it was a that it was a botched armed robbery. Um, we the, like I said, the criminal profiler that came in and looked at everything um, has has we believe that that's what it is. Now again, that's what we believe. But but if we find information that leads us a different direction, then we may go the different direction. I think the sheriff is making a great point. Obviously, we're looking at this through a very small window of information that they are choosing to release. Um, what's interesting to me about it is it seems like he's fairly strong that this is a robbery, but that should mean that the connectivity between Elijah and the perpetrator isn't probably all that strong. Um, there's, there's a chance they might not know each other at all. Over at ClassicCityNews.com, after two months, Oconee County store clerk's killer remains unidentified. Sheriff James Hale remains confident the killer will be found and arrested. Quote, we will continue to track down all leads and use every resource at our disposal to find Elijah's killer. I personally believe that it's only a matter of time. We've secured a number of data search warrants for electronic devices and are analyzing this data as it comes in. That is a really interesting point. I'm wondering if they're doing some type of geofence where they effectively reach out to Google and say, hey, you know, any cell phones that came into this particular area at this particular time, we, we need to know who, who those people are. The sheriff revealed that his office had received a tip that the killer might be someone with whom Wood had an argument prior to being killed. 
though we did receive a tip that Elijah had been involved in a verbal altercation with a customer, we had not been able to confirm the altercation on at least a month's worth of video, Hale said. So that's the first thing where we kind of get, maybe there's something else that's going on in this case that could actually be some type of connection. Admittedly, it's still through the store, but some type of disagreement that he had with someone in the store, and then they came back. But, you know, sheriff's office is saying they haven't been able to confirm that that argument happened. Investigators have also looked at Wood's friends and acquaintances to see if anyone might have had a motive to kill him. We are waiting on the FBI to send their team here from Quantico to determine the approximate descriptors of our suspect based on their court proven techniques, the sheriff said. We will then release that information. Uh, that sounds like profiling information as well. Um, must be a different level of it because this is happening after that clip that we just listened to. Uh, this article was only posted May 19th. Looks like we'll have updates on this case hopefully soon. Back at onlineathens.com, some messages from his brother-in-law, Tripp. We're having a hard time understanding how this could happen to somebody like him. Someone so nice and friendly to everybody. Wood, as did his father, Todd Wood, who for many years worked a night shift at the Golden Pantry at Butler's Crossing in Watkinsville, was aware of the potential dangers of late night work in a convenience store, according to Tripp Lemons. They didn't have a fear of it because they knew the dangers. You meet the regulars who come in and then certain others come in that give you a little bit of a weird feeling, Lemon said. Lemon said that some investigators now believe that his brother-in-law was killed in a botched robbery. I felt it too because Elijah didn't have enemies. No one was mad at him and he didn't mess around with drugs or anything like that. We can speculate anything, but it was a botched robbery. They didn't get what they wanted and they shot Elijah. Now, interestingly, you know, we've heard a pretty strong statement from the sheriff previously. He's saying that a profiler is telling him that's what it looks like as well. But we get a quote in this article, and it sounds like his position might not be as strong as we think. Quote, if we can't find anything else that makes sense, we'll go with a robbery attempt. That makes the most sense. So at least he's staying open to other possibilities and still probably investigating leads in that as well, because... Um, I don't know. It just it just seems it seems hard to believe with the way the video looks that that is a robbery attempt. I mean, I suppose if it's the person's first time and everything just goes wrong and they just bail on it, maybe that's a possibility. I, I would say this is definitely not an experienced robber's robbery attempt based on what we're seeing here. Quote, most of the leads we're getting now are repeat leads from things we've already cleared or are still trying to track down information, Hale said. Officers have interviewed more than 10 people as possible suspects based on information from tipsters and other leads, but most had alibis investigators were able to confirm. Investigators also lean heavily on the belief that the figure in dark clothing and mask is a male. We're, we feel pretty sure it's a male, but again, without knowing for sure, Hale said. So it seems like their belief is going with male. Lemons himself has studied the video repeatedly and said he had it slowed down to real time. The original video released moves at a higher speed. Now, that could seriously alter your perception. Um, we've talked about cases before where video speed has been altered for things released to the public, and it really alters their perception. Um, but... I haven't heard about it in this direction before. Why would you speed up the video? Like slowing down the video, you know, you get a better look at the suspect as they're moving. Why speed it up? I've never heard of this, this happening like this before. Uh, back to his point, if you look at the released video, it looks like a direct hit on Elijah. But that is truly off. And even the sheriff will tell you he doesn't feel that's what it is, Lemons said. Well, wouldn't it be cool if we knew someone that could fix the speed? I have slowed it down uh, approximately 30%. It seems to be about right. And I can't know that for sure, obviously, without a time code on it. But you'll see the movements kind of make more sense. In the original video, it did certainly look sped up, uh, especially in the bouncing movement when they're about to leave and then come back in and they're kind of bouncing. The hops look weird because of how quick they're happening. So here it is uh, slowed down approximately 
And that certainly looks more natural. You also get a clearer shot of that thumb kind of coming out and then whatever conversation is happening as they step up, step up. And then look at how much time we have here now before they run out. Now, that's a that's quite a bit more time for the interaction. There's a lot that could be being said there. And even this one, it's a little bit longer, but still not much on this second thing. I don't know what they were thinking running back, back up there. Um, I've also made a version of this where I've kept it at what I think is the proper speed and done some zooms on it. So let's just go ahead and check this out. I almost think that they're they're trying to convey confidence. Uh, here I've highlighted, There's you can see nothing that's going on here except there's a little bit of reflection that's happening in the movement there. And then they run out, come back in, here's that hopping motion. And then run out again. So I got to say, seeing the speed slowed down, I do think that there is a much stronger chance of the botched robbery theory. There's just more time for interaction that's going on on their first attempt to get up to the counter. The second attempt, I still don't know. Um, Hale releases some more information about the other video. We believe that is our suspect's vehicle, Hale said. I didn't, it didn't pull into the parking lot of the racetrack, but it comes by at about the right time and does things that are obvious to us that makes it the suspect's vehicle. Lemons believes a second person could be involved, someone who drove the car that brought the killer to the store. And he makes a really good point about this. If there is another person that's involved here, it's a great opportunity for that driver to say, I made a mistake and this is what happened. Absolutely. If there is a second person that's a component to this, you don't want to be attached to what this robber did. You don't want the weight of those charges coming in your direction, and you're just going to be a straight-up accomplice now, and you're going down with them. Uh, if there is someone that was the getaway driver, I hope they're out there. I hope they're watching the media around this. Uh, Trip actually talked about this on the podcast episode as well. Call it in help this case get yourself protected from a major major fallout he continues here that uh trip did talk to law enforcement about the potential of a second person being involved and what he was told was that person could be charged with murder as well you really want to be on the right side of that courtroom in a situation like this especially if this was something as simple uh, as, hey, I was told I was going to be in on this robbery. They were going to cut me in for half. Next thing I know, this person's running out and says, go, go, go. There's no money. They say that they've murdered this guy that was working there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, someone can come around on that and also just help this family find the justice that they deserve. Over at fox5atlanta.com, they didn't kill a store clerk. They killed a family member. They killed somebody that the whole entire community loved. And that's not a family member. That's the sheriff saying that, Sheriff James Hale Jr. You can go anywhere and ask people about the big guy with a big smile at racetrack, and they know who he is, said the brother-in-law Tripp. Tripp describes Woods as a giant teddy bear who never met a stranger. Elijah saw everyone as good. He loved meeting people and talking to them. Elijah loved living. That's what he loved. There is a Facebook group. Uh, Trip is one of the admins on this group. Please follow it. I'll have a link to it in the description box down below. To Elijah's family, I hope you know that you've got several thousand more supporters out here. We're all standing behind you. We're all waiting for justice to be served in this case. And we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay here until we see it with you. I'm really, really sorry that you guys are facing all this. And I just want you to know that um, on top of the amazing community that you have there locally, you've got a big community out here too. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several people who are contributing to the channel. They have now joined on Patreon. A big thank you to Justine Willman for joining, as well as PV 
and Lindsay Jean. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Deborah Dobbs recently did. We really appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these terrible situations. I can't do it without you guys. Remember, no shows next week, but we will we will be back on June 7th with the regular schedule, and I do hope to meet some of you at CrimeCon in Austin. Take care. We'll see you again real soon back here on the Lord and Arch channel. <laughs>